Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Justin from Mobile Caddy. Uh, we've been working with uh, Thomas and Joanna and Jane Nick, and plenty of other people from Homeless to look at Inform and, and mobile in general. So what I'd like to do is start off and give you um, an introduction to, to mobile, um, particularly how it's affecting organisations, so you can start to see some ideas of what other people are doing and also some of the challenges we face around mobile and the pace of technology and I think Lawrence was saying with lightning of course things move so I just want to give you a little bit of an idea around that first and then we're going to have a look at um, one of your peers uh, ship uh, who have been working uh, on the pilot program to look at some of the basics of Inform Mobile and give you an idea of how far they've got, uh, see the sort of thing they're doing and hopefully hear what you like what would you like to happen uh, and, and some feedback from, from yourselves as well. Um, so we'll start off, um, shout, I think there was good some shout outs there, so we're going to cover some ground. So if you've got anything, just shout out as we go. There's only a short uh, session, so we've got to cover two big halves, the sort of why and then what we've done. So if there's anything going through, either hold it to the end, but I'm more happy just to give us a wave and shout out. Definitely interrupt. If you think I'm saying anything that sounds a bit odd, challenge us, because that's exactly what it's about. Um, and lastly, I think there's already been a bit of sharing in the room. You're all on different journeys and different stages of inform, different stages of mobile, and if I can use the word digital transformation, we're all sort of slowly pushing towards that in different areas. So if you've got things that you think are beneficial, not for this, but for anything in general, I think it's great to, to shout out. Um, so first I get to ask some questions. Um, could I ask for a raise of hands if anyone has Amazon installed in a mobile app on their on their phone? 50%, okay. Um, and keeping up, who has ordered anything from Amazon on their phone? Okay, and last question, did anyone train you how to do that? No, okay. This is consumer mobile. So consumer mobile, we're going to see is, it's, it's different from enterprise, but it shouldn't be. And so we'll have a look, and that will start to make a bit more sense as we come through, the who's, so who's actually going mobile, the why, and then the how, and hopefully the ship pilot will show you how that's progressing. Um, but we'll start to answer some questions as we go through and see actually there's a net effect on all of us. Um, I have one last question on um, mobile. Just who has um, email on their, on their phone? Does there one email from their phone? But there is a question about what and what is enterprise mobility. So we have to keep using these words because we've run out of words. So enterprise mobility is being used across uh, across the piece. But we're really thinking about apps on our phone. Um, so what is enterprise mobility? The best way to think about it is the analogy with Salesforce itself. And 16, 17 years ago, uh, Mark Benioff, um, Parker Harris, and a few others really were frustrated that we couldn't use software in the organization like we did, say, for Amazon. So back in 1999, 2000, we could go on and order online, just like you guys have ordered today on your Amazon app, and yet we go into um, Oracle-based systems or te terrible systems that took uh, five, five or six weeks to learn how to use it, uh, and then it still didn't do what you wanted to do. So uh, Mark's idea and Salesforce's idea generally was around making the browser-based software that we use in organizations as simple as the Amazon.com web website. But now we're flicking through into mobile and what we're seeing is that we're really needing the apps to be as easy to use as our Amazon app. So it's no good taking our desktop experience, for example, and just squidging it onto a browser because that just doesn't work. The way we work with mobile is very different. So are we all desk bound here? I'm generally desk bound. Um, so we're all using laptops and we've, we've got a keyboard in front of us. That's how we're working all the time. When we go to mobile, even if that's our normal job, I'll slip out my device and I'll do one little job and then I'll slip it back in. My primary job is not the device and yet inside my primary job is, is the laptop or the PC. And so it's not a case of taking what Salesforce did 15, 16 years ago and just transposing it onto the phone. And the steps around Lightning is exactly where they're heading in on the browser as well, because people are now doing having the little clip of the message down is because we are multitasking all the time. That's like, what's this? What's going on? And, and the mobile is very, very different because we're actually doing stuff off the mobile as well as on it. 
So who's mobile? We'll cover these questions. Who's mobile? It's pretty much everyone, every organization. The fact that you're all here today means you're moving around. I know plenty of you have staff and volunteers off-site all the time. Um, but even the most desk-bound person, if I'm standing on a train station, I can see everyone is on the mobile. And so this exclusiveness of saying, well, it's just a field worker or just a service worker, it really is taken away. Um, and also, we're now extending the boundaries through communities as well. And you guys obviously have very strong communities. Um, the community piece around Salesforce is very strong and gaining a lot of traction as well. So extending out the digital organization beyond the internal users to the external users and then to the wider community. So it's pretty much everyone. Um, the, the why I always find the most interesting because it's really where we all start our journey from generally around most things. Um, and it is a nirvana, it is this promise of mobile. It, we're going to see it's not the easiest thing to get to, but it's well worth it. When we look at some of these, what we can think that can happen once we have mobile, the fact is that I can gain insight into my custom, into my case, into whatever it is from my device whenever I want it. I'm going to be much more productive. I can collect more data. My device has capabilities such as uh, camera, signature capture, these types of things that we would never do on the desktop. The amount of paperwork processing I can reduce, big bonus. The other thing is I can do data validation as well. So like we do in the browser, instead of having a pen and paper and saying, what's your national insurance number? And then we get it back to the office thing, what the blimey is this number? Um, I can validate that on the device. So I'm, my data integrity is also very strong. So this isn't a full list, but it gives you some idea that when you start to think about transposing what we do from pen and paper into business process, we get absolute benefits we do on a platform, but we also get this new piece, which is around mobile, which is because the fact I am mobile, I'm face to face. And if I can design the UI, the user interface, in such a way that it helps me through the task, I should use the mobile less and spend more time doing the work that you want the field work to be doing. Um, and that's the whole idea. So there is a question, why are we not doing it today? Um, it is one of those things where we call it the app gap. So it's the difference if we all sat down and said, what would be great for an organization to have in terms of mobile and mobile apps? And the simple question then is, why haven't we done that? Um, because there is so much to gain, the question is quite pertinent. And that's really because it's a bit like pre-99 with Salesforce. Um, if we were to go and build, say, Inform, uh, or any application, Salesforce application, SFA as it started, um, and we were in 97, 98, we would have had to go and get our own servers, we would have had to get some database administrators, the skill sets would have gone on, and uh, we would need a pretty big check as well, just to get started. Um, so it was very, very hard, and mobile has been, up until this point, very, very similar like that. It's also been very risky, so early adopters, We've all been early adopters in mobile. We've all burnt our fingers and understood that that brings in a lot of risk because if it goes wrong, where's the data? So it's a, it's a big, big important piece of the risk. The other thing about mobile, and actually it's happening in the browser as well, more and more with things like Chrome. Chrome updates all the time. So the browser of choice for most developers and now a lot of business as well. And it's, it's moving all the time. So Salesforce are now standing on quicksand as well. Mobile is even worse. So I would imagine how many people have had an OS update of some description on their phone in the last year? Definitely I have, I don't know, I don't think from Apple. Um, every time that happens, if we were to go to a, a big corporation and say, what do you think, guys, we're going to give you five updates to your operating systems on your laptops, you'd be thrown out the door because it means I've got to test and retest and check everything. So this never-ending piece, the fact it's moving, needs to be accepted and instead of push to one side, we need to embrace it because those updates do give us benefit. So, question, who is using business applications on their phone or their tablet today? Okay, and just to rewind, to give me a balance, who's using email on their phones? So there's our big misconception. And you guys are already all using business application on your phones. Right? It's just because you see it as a consumer application that you think that's fine. I 
quickly start an email, it gets dropped, I put it in my pocket, I carry on. Just as interest, two people had their hands up about business applications. What were they? Successful yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're quite contained. But if you were to look, um, I'll give you an example of my phone. Um, of course, I should do this because that's what I'm after. I've probably got close to 200 apps on my phone. And I'd say 90% of them are business. I'm oddball, for sure, but <laughs> I can do everything on here. So the presentation that kindly went wrong for me this morning, I was doing that on the train, on the phone, on the way up. If I want to process an order, I can do that here. I can, what else am I got here? I've got various feeds, I've got uh, my side deck, my Evernote, everything's going on here. In fact, if I look at my personal side, um, all my banking is now done on my phone. Does anyone else do banking on your phone? No. And is it because it's easier? It is for me. When we're running a payroll and I'm a bit tight, I can actually run my payroll while I'm going to the train. And so it's a, it's, it's a perception issue about the application, not what we want to do with it. So we already know what we want to do with it. It's just easy business as a consumer. And what I'm hoping to show you today really is that you've already broken through the breach. You are using business applications all the time. They're just not good enough. And that's because of the three things that we saw back there. So what are organizations doing? Um, there is a big uptake usage of Salesforce One, and Salesforce One to take standard process and put it on your phone is definitely a, a valuable thing to have. When you get to mobile, though, we need to think about custom process, because that fact is I don't want to take, let's say I'm doing a, 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 an interview of some sort with someone in a room. I don't want to take 10, 15 minutes to do that. I need to take a few seconds to do that and interact with the client or whoever I'm doing. Um, but organizations are taking this and running with it now. And some of these screenshots we've got down here just show you these are all Salesforce applications. They just don't look like Salesforce. And you'll see the progression with Lightning. It will be three, four, five years, but all our Salesforces will look different because that's where Salesforce are going. It's all about the UI and the UX now. That's the split between lightning. So there's a bigger play going on here. Um, but the UI, the experience, is now becoming a key differentiator. I'll give you a, an easy uh, example for us to look at, which is if I'm going to hail a cab, and I've got a choice between Uber and, um, is it hail me in London? Hail? Hail. Hail. It's not hail. That's right. Um, is there any difference to the car that's going to pick me up? Probably not. Is there any difference to the driver? Probably not. My experience is all going to be around how I use the application. If I can get that cab in 20 seconds versus two minutes, I'm going to use that application. And it's exactly the same for business applications. And that's really, really important, but, but unfortunately, generally left to the side because the capability has been so hard to achieve. So, I've got a couple of case studies I'll just quickly talk through, just to give you an example of what nonprofits are doing. Um, but nonprofits and commercial are very, very similar in this space. We've all got the same challenges. So we could take a commercial uh, case study as well as a non-profit, and it would be very similar pain points and challenges. So the one that uh, when I first met Jane, we were talking about was a company called Sanergy, um, which are an African charity. But I'm going to talk to you today first about one called um, Eco Energy, just to give you a feel of what can happen to an organization when they embrace the mobile side. They sell solar panels in Pakistan. Um, what they do is they take the amount of electricity the owner of the property is already using, they do some fancy calculation, work out this, the solar power input required, and then do a microfinancing around. The actual solar panels they've got grants for, they've done all that work. What they're finding very difficult is to train the locals to be able to say, how do you calculate the consumption of a solar panel? <laughs> I can't do it either. So it's, you know, it's one of those things. Now, if you're going to scale this out, these guys and girls on the ground, they know the local population, they're part of that, they're the best people to use, but their problem is how do they get that skill set out in the field and how do they validate that's happening? Because once they've ordered one of these solar panels, it's going to be pretty embarrassing and pretty expensive to send that thing back, and so we didn't get it right. So their journey has been on defining process first, nothing to do with mobile, um, or not specific to mobile, and understanding how an interface could develop to allow them to have a very simple UI, because we don't want lots of language barriers, and understand then how to calculate that with green ticks and crosses and so on and so forth. 
So even an organization that's thousands of miles away, non-English speaking, can take something from the back end of Salesforce, which is a back end app, and produce an application that's very simple to use, deploy it to the field, and maintain it. And really the point I'm trying to drive home is that if an organization like that can do that, then so should we be able to do that. And so that's where we are uh, today. So the question really is, once we have this ability uh, of being able to take process, critical process, process that must not go wrong, from the platform to the device, what can we do? And it's really interesting once we start to look at how you bring technologies together, this is the cusp that happens. And we've seen this happen. Salesforce themselves was only enabled really because of the speed of the internet, the ability of the browsers to take cost of the PCs, all these things converged at a certain time and allowed Salesforce, although it wasn't the, the easiest few years for them until 2003, 2005, that's where they got to. We're probably at the same sort of point 2004, 5 uh, with mobile now with these technologies that we've got. So Salesforce gives us a fantastic platform, a single point of data. It gives us things like validation and workflow and some of the stuff we've been talking about today. It scales. Uh, there's something like, I think, 1,500, 2,000 servers running uh, worldwide, something like that, and there's an army of people looking after that for them. <coughs> so we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about security. We, we've even got mirroring across the Atlantic, well, that doesn't always help, uh, which is coming to Europe. We've got all these things that would cost a fortune. We've then got Mobile Caddy, which was developed to really extend the platform out onto mobile devices, iOS and Android keep up with the changing pace of technology to make sure that nothing goes wrong. And then finally, we've got what is the domain expertise in the room, which is obviously going to be a lot, um, to come together and say, can we create an application that can take the best pieces and the right pieces and move that into the field uh, for, your, um, for your critical processes to be able to be extended uh, out. And I think we were one of the people, am I? Um, we're going to uh, definitely not show any smoke and mirrors, but for the sake of the, the guys on the line, we're going to use an emulator uh, to show you the application. But I've also got the application running here on an iPad, on uh, an Android device here, uh, and I think, uh, Jamie, you've got a couple running at the back as well. So if you, if you want to have a look afterwards, we can't show the webinar that, but we'll be able to do the emulator in a second. Um, and so the journey really began from a non-profit meetup a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and we started to say, look, we know everyone's going to go mobile, what should we do? And it took us a little while to find a, a, a good case study to use, um, a, a, a good organization in the sense that they were young, starting within form, small enough, nimble enough to have, have, have a crack with us. Question? Yes. Um, so this is offline on, on the on mobile? Absolutely. What happens if somebody else, either centrally or wherever, wants to do something with this customer's data at the same time as it's offline? It's a good question. So conflict resolution, which is really that fancy word that sums all that up, is saying, if I have data that resides here and here, how do I handle that? Uh, and offline is a big problem initially when you approach that because you have to make some choices. Um, one of the lucky things I was saying is that we're sort of at 2004, 2005 in the sort of Salesforce same sort of idea is that most of these um, choices have already been made and now there's systems that handle it. So for example, uh, this application that we wrote here says it's the last change to the record that becomes the final record. So let me give you an example. If I'm on the platform and I'm working with myself, the record Justin, and someone else is in the field working with record Justin, and someone changes me this nickname and this nickname, so we change exactly the same field, I'm offline. This system mod stamp of, say, uh, 10 o'clock Tuesday will be respected if this was 10 o'clock Wednesday, even if my sync will happen two days later. That's by field. By field level, absolutely. So you can go record or field level. You can also uh, protect around certain fields. So for example, um, you can have only the device um, data always win or the platform data always win. So if there was something sensitive that only ever got filled in in the field, you would set that behavior, three point and click as a behavior 
to only accept data from the mobile device. That's quite common with things like recording sort of field data and so on and so forth. So, something I was thinking about was maybe an alert. So, uh, so uh, somebody goes out to, to see a customer. Yes. And they're doing the, the mobile thing. And then somebody, central, let's say, finds out something that's happened with regards to that customer and wants to set an alert. I mean, the, the, the person who's, who's mobile won't see it. No, that's correct. So, uh, there's, so as soon as you go offline, you need to... Uh, so one of the things that we've been doing is spending a lot of time about looking at how the behavior of the flows works. So for example, you can have an alert here that when a conflict is managed, some two pieces of data have changed, you can actually have a workflow alert that straight out Salesforce box that will tell you that this and this has, this has been changed. Um, one of those things is the learning that we've been doing for our, with the pilot is to work out which of the fields should take priority in general and then allow you to change that behavior. Um, we didn't touch too much on the technical side of offline first, but conflict resolution is one of the big ones. Alerting around change of data is a big one. Um, but all of those now are quite mature in the sense that you've got, say, two or three options. So instead of having to detail all these potentially this or this or this, we can say choose one, two, or three, and that type of thing. And is it mobile users that you see using and then seeing that sort of potential conflict? from central to, to, to devices. And maybe one other question if I can. Would that happen if there are potentially two different mobile users as well as the platform versus the mobile user? Do you see it at that scale? I think it's less likely if that's possible. So all of those three scenarios are, are handled uh, and they're handled in the behavior setting uh, through the design process of, of, of the application. And I think the critical point there was that if, you, if someone if we have a, a if we have an alert on a record, yes, that all workers working with that client need to be aware of as soon as possible after it's created. It's like that idea of whether those alerts get pushed through to the mobile, if so, which they won't if they're all offline. Absolutely. So it's a question of how frequently the mobile data can synchronise back with the yeah. back, yes. with the back end. I, I I misread that a little bit then. So one of the things I would do there is when you're offline, regardless whether you're an offline mobile application or offline email, for example, you're offline. So what I would say is if you have critical notification, uh, you've also got the platform to lean on as well from an email perspective. So for example, you could say, if I am the owner of the client, or the owner of the record of the client, and for example, their status goes to uh, Amber, or whatever it is that you may have, uh, send me an email. So that you are also immediately informing that person via mail that may be outside of their mobile device then. Um, particularly around if you've only got, and this is a question for all of uh, mobile users, regardless whether we're talking about this application or any application, is whether the device is uh, 3G or Wi-Fi only. And that's a big choice that we have to make, um, and unfortunately it comes down to cost in a lot of instances. So with the phone, um, we take it for granted that 99% of the time I'm going to be connected. So if, if I'm running this application as I have here, I can run this application right now on this device uh, and see uh, what I see offline, um, but I know that probably as I walk out the door, I'm going to pick up my 3G connection and I'll be back to where I was and my sync will work in. If I go to this device, which is Wi-Fi only, it's now much more a user interaction to make sure I've connected. But one of the things we can do on the other, the other side, which actually is in this application, is if it's a Wi-Fi only device and I've created data, so this is me on the device, we can also put a local notification and we can decide, for example, that in an hour, remind me that I put some data in, but I'm offline. So trying to drive that user behavior uh, through. In fact, we'll probably hear this one ping in a minute when I put some data in. Um, but yeah, the general idea then is capture of data, reading of data offline, logic. Uh, we didn't see that there, but what we can do here is we can take a client and we can choose a timeline event, maybe a multiple uh, list of timeline events, and, and what we're doing there is we're providing some logic in the background to make sure instead of having to click through many screens, um, this was something we worked on together, was to drive the process in, in the process that the user would do rather than maybe we would do on the laptop. So I've gone to Bob, I'm going to create, I want to record something around Bob, I select the timeline event first, which is actually backwards, um, and then I, I actually record within that same session and I'm saving all the time. 
And I think who was talking about auto save on the uh, on the platform? Yeah. Um, interestingly, when you go to mobile, auto save is really important uh, because we all we all forget to plug our phones in in the morning and stuff like that. Um, so you'd be halfway through a process. So the understanding of what's a draft and what's saved is again very very important. So we would look at process and say when you've captured X, let's save X and Y. When you've captured Y, let's save Y and Y. Potentially introducing another status such as draft, because I still want to finish the record. And that was what I was going to say. I know we have taken questions on auto save. Auto save is very very difficult because if it's auto save and you haven't filled in three of the fields, what happens if your workflow now kicks off? And they're the problems that you've got uh, on the platform as you have on your device. So the idea about a draft status is protecting your workflow, so you make sure none of your triggers or your workflow kicked off while your record is in uh, a draft. So I'll flip back uh, to the slides while we go through. Um, so the the feedback piece, which I was hoping, you know, we already had a not, not nice couple of conversations. Um, from what you've briefly seen in terms of what's loosely called Inform Mobile, I think it's just our working title inside, and what's actually been deployed, um, quick show of hands, does anyone see the value, first of all, for their particular organization or, 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 or their users? Um, what would be the most, just for the hands up, what's the most important piece uh, in terms of benefit and the most challenge that you would see. Just want to throw a few out so that we can see if there's a commonality. What, what would be the most? So from a reasonably large organisation, security is always so people get very nervous about data stored locally, so they want to know how how that's managed and how if the device gets lost or something, that, that data um, can be accessed by someone else. Definitely. That's really good. Is everyone you know, generally concerned in security, for sure. Um, so I'll touch on that because I think it's a biggie. Um, the first thing is, for if you had an MDM, as we saw, uh, you can you can work with that. But that's going to be out of reach for a little while for the, um, the organization sizes. In fact, it's still really, even the big guys are struggling. So what's, the what's the MDM? It's a way of uh, managing applications on a device that you don't own. So you could, because a lot of your guys, I expect, will be using their own devices. And even if you said don't use your own devices, they probably will have a go because they prefer their device to the ones that you give them. Um, so MDM allows us to put a partition, basically, we think that they're basically put on an, uh, a non-corporate device and allow you to monitor and remove the application. Um, I find data to be encrypted and um, needs some kind of access to get into it. So even without MDM, then it's sort of relatively difficult to find getting in that information. Absolutely. So MDM does fall down where you're offline because MDM requires a connection to say I'm good uh, or take it away from me. So it's really interesting. We literally just implemented a project uh, at the back end of last year where what we've got now is a pin lock um, and a pin lock, immediate pin lock, and a pin lock sync to unlock. So if I, if I enter either five times or whatever it is, my device is locked out and then I can uh, unlock that from this because it's not only um, the data that we assume is useful. I think there was an idea of someone being made uh, or kindly leaving the organization and disappearing and taking whatever data with us. So the ability to, to stop that. So the first layer is a secure encrypted store, which is a Salesforce technology. Uh, that's what all of these apps are built on, called the Salesforce SDK. And then across the top, we build in an application layer that will allow a pin lock uh, to unlock. Um, so with me, uh, of course, I've got my email on here. I actually use the, the, the thumbprint and so on in the code. But as you move out from, let's say, uh, technical users to non-technical users, I'm sure there's still plenty of people who have their email running on their phone, don't have a pin lock on their phone. You know, it's, it's highly dangerous. So we can't expect the users. So in answer, you've got uh, an encrypted layer, and then you've got a pin lock uh, or implementation of the pin lock. Does that sound like it would sort of put the tick across the security box for, for most of us? I think to a degree, but I mean, I think there also has to be an element of, of, of a push to connect. You know, the, the device, when it's offline, you know, you're going to have to make sure that that device connects at a certain point. Because otherwise, whoever's using it will still be able to see whatever is on there until they update or, you know, get a connection. 
something that you didn't want to be It's a balance. Yeah. As soon as, so this, this is the line, as soon as I'm disconnected, because I need to be disconnected, because I need to work offline, uh, that means I need to see the data without a connection. That means I don't get the signal to destroy the device. However, if I have a, a use case where I know that I can use that device for X amount of time before it unlocks, you see what I'm sort of driving to exactly as you're saying, there's a, there's a, there's a decision to be made. Yeah. The one that we were talking about actually was passport data across European borders. Um, and they've got to have this passport data to get on ferries and so on and so forth. So they've just had to make a business decision, pass it through their legal. And what's actually happening though, and that's where we're going from one place to another, is that data today is in pen and paper form and being moved around uh, completely with no knowledge. Uh, so at least we're moving up the stack, if you like, to say actually we can secure, say, 75% of the cases and the 25 will have to accept um, not a downgrade of security, but maybe a downgrade of capability, i.e. the user can't use that until they've logged on each day. So one of the things you can think about in terms of process, five minutes left, um, is to actually have a start day process, which is always quite interesting, because I'm generally going to be starting from my home or from my office. So the first thing I do in the morning, and this has been implemented quite a number of times, is I connect because I'm on a known Wi-Fi in general, so I start my day, and that might be giving me my, uh, my work to do, or it might just be passing me a security token to say you've got 24 hours of access, you know, and then slowly bringing that down. How, how does that sound as a sort of yeah. intermediate function? It's hard one. Yeah, yeah. It's really hard. Um, and that's why I was saying it's nice that a lot of people have already been through these journeys, so there's already sort of two or three choices, and then you've got to find, uh, find that. So, in terms of challenge security, is there anything else really challenging that we think? Flexibility to make changes. We have services that come in on and off all the time. And I need a microphone. Yes, please. <laughs> um, flexibility to make changes. We have services coming on and services coming off via contracts all the time. And a lot of the time, they might ask for custom fields in, in form. How quickly or adaptable is the system to just change fields relatively quickly? Yeah, it's a really good question. So that's the question that we're tussling with at the moment internally. Um, so with the, so if that's going to be the same for Lightning if you don't customize Lightning. So as soon as you want to customize something, uh, there could be a piece of debt that we've got to pay for because it's different. Having said that, for example, the example you gave for an extra service, um, that is the sort of conversation that we want so that the services would be in a, configura a configurable file. Uh, let's say the pick list that we were uh, using as an example, so that the ones that are highly uh, likely to be configured would be in a, an administration configuration uh, basis rather than being in a, an application level basis. So very similar to how Salesforce works today. Um, an example was the services. Are you thinking of anything else? Um, well, it's, it's not just the services. For example, we might get a service online that's so actually in form we need you to report X, Y, and Z, see which other services haven't asked before, so suddenly you've got three new fields, possibly with validation, and it's like, well, how quickly can we get that out to the mobile home? Yeah, um, that's pretty much the conversation we were having, isn't it? Um, yeah. So, with the field level, to customise, you would be looking at customization of your particular app. Uh, so it's totally doable, but there is a cost specific to, to that org. Um, we didn't look in detail, we call it gap. I mentioned this, 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 this gap. One of the gaps is accessibility. Um, <coughs> so capability-wise, you know, there's big ticks now. Things can be done, the offline security piece, they're all coming up to a level where we feel very comfortable and large organizations are now using them. The accessibility piece is where we're working very hard to keep bringing down um, the, the, the costs, not just monetary costs, but maybe the time costs and so on, so that these changes can be done. We're not quite a parity in the sense of Salesforce's ease of change for point and click, but it's quite close now. So we would say, hey, uh, inform admins or your internal team, can we have X field and X field added? Uh, and then we would look and say, can we mobilize them? That now only takes a very short space of time, a few clicks. And then we would have to go and look at the application code and say, do you want some extra validation? And, and more likely, how does that work on mobile even though you put it on the platform? Because it would be different. So uh, security and configurability, any any other challenges we, we, we see? 
But this may be a dumb question because I'm not a technical person. Why does smart bar have to be in offline? So offline first is slightly different to offline. Um, what that really means is, um, and I'm going to use a really bad case here because I, I got, I got uh, uh, smashed around the face with this this morning, didn't I, with my Google. Um, but Google, all the products you use with Google are, are offline first. In other words, what happens is if you are going through transient connection, uh, so as, as we see here, as soon as you lose connection, you are potentially losing connection for a long period of time, or you might just be dipping in and out, jumping into a tube and, and up. To allow um, the application to continue to operate with, with me as the user not even knowing, offline first means that the data is stored in a local store first and then synchronized. So it's, it's near real time, but it's safe. So if I've done five reports and I'm just about to press save, and the auto save is a good example of the danger you see, um, and I don't have a connection, the majority of application will lose that data today. Okay, so it's only offline when it needs to be offline. It's online if there's a link. Yeah, it's a slightly more complicated than that in the sense that the records will be batched just because of limits on APIs and syncing time. But in general, when you finish a process, it will put all the records up onto the platform and bring any new ones down, and that's a big piece of the efficiency. It's also why there's a difference between Salesforce One and, and, and say, a, a custom application, whether it be mobile cab or not. Uh, Salesforce One has to talk to the server all the time. Um, now that's because it has to look after all of us. So it has to have all our metadata. Whereas when you build a custom application, you can actually be much more fine in terms of the uh, metadata you're taking, which means we can make that much more efficient. Um, but yeah, offline first is really, really important. There is another session of that one that Jane attended where we talk about what we call more design, and they're the key factors to having a robust application. Um, and offline, robust, and efficient are the three in the middle that are really, really important. Um, we've got, so did you say, Papa store a couple of minutes? I'd like yeah, to get some benefits and add some challenges. <laughs> is that it? Uh, so from what we've seen, we've got uh, a, a definitely, offline is, a, is, is definitely a challenge. Configurability and security, definitely. Um, so there's a question. Yeah. Can you have a certain specification phone that's far from lazy then? It's a uh, good point. So uh, Salesforce actually pull us along on that one, and iOS pushes. us. Um, so with uh, Salesforce, really in our iOS device, um, it's not, you, know, you have to go back a number of years to, to find an iOS device. Android is different. Android it gets locked at operating system levels. So um, 4.4 in the Android world is the sort of base level now. So Salesforce just for Christmas uh, bought the 4.4 layer in. So if you're buying an Android device, if you're ever buying an Android device um, and you want a bit of advice, just give us a shout because the manufacturer dictates a lot. Uh, so for example, Samsung holds you at, uh, at, at the level. So you end up with a device, and uh, not just us. So the, our CTO yesterday pinged me, he's a big Sky Sports fan. He said, my, my tablet has just told me it will not run Sky Sports anymore because it's on 4.2, and Sky Sports have gone to 4.4 only because they move along with the technology. So very, device choices is important if you can handle it. 4.4 is quite old, though, just to give a balance. Um, so two minutes on benefits. Uh, from what you've seen, what would be the big benefits of having sort of informed mobile in a pocket uh, with your external users, uh, maybe we can shout a couple out. Of what <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll do the benefit then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the benefit for us would be the, the offline mode because um, although everyone's supposedly connected all the time, we have a lot of uh, rural areas where there just isn't the connectivity. Right. And our staff frequently get frustrated with either typing something on the laptop and having to take, take it back to the office to get a connection then retype it back in or using pens and paper or whatever archaic means they want to use. Um, yeah. So yeah, for, for us, offline would be a huge benefit for the system. Great. Okay, not so long, yeah. Is it in general? And of course, what, when you look at the benefit of offline, really it's the, it's the solution to the challenge, because what you're really mentioning, the benefit is that reduction in paperwork and processing, isn't it? Which is what you really want, it's just this barrier. So they're the ones to think about, because if you can slide those challenges out of way, how much more can you do? Um, but yeah, I think with that, I uh, know I'm on time, so uh, okay. that's great. If there's any other questions? So, 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 so people should, if you, if you think you're, you're interested in kind of finding out more about Informat, potentially Informat mobile, rather than potentially using it in your organisation to, to raise a case, 
contact us and um, we'll be uh, definitely yeah. continuing to support it. Although we've been providing the technology, both Joanna and Thomas have been in, you know, implementing the design of the app alongside so the UI and the business flows. So you know, between us, we're all very aware, so give us a shout. We can start to have a look at uh, maybe and answer maybe some of the challenges that you think about uh, on the train home when you go to use your mobile. It's not offline. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it.